Welcome back to Be History. Today we're going to be talking about the Eulenburg Affair, which took place from 1906 to 1909. This affair was a Wilhelmine court scandal that affected the Kaiser and a coterie of his closest advisors. It was a minor factor in the lead up to World War I. It is also an important feature of LGBTQ history. The Eulenburg Affair took place in Germany, specifically Wilhelmine, Germany, ruled at the time by Kaiser Wilhelm II. He succeeded to the throne in 1888 and ruled until 1918. He abdicated the throne and died sometime later in the 1930s. One of the first acts of Kaiser Wilhelm's reign was his dismissal of Otto von Bismarck in 1890. This set him on a course of personal-based rule, and he would try to be a great influence on the politics of the empire. Sometimes successfully, most of the times not so successfully. Now this is an era full of stagnation, political decadence, and Despite ideological development in science, philosophy, psychiatry, the art, music, despite all this, Germany stagnated considerably in the realm of politics and especially in the field of international relations. One of the biggest things to note here at the beginning, we are in a time under paragraph 175, criminalizing certain kinds of intimate homosexual acts. The state of homosexuality in Germany during this time, it was one of the most intolerant periods. The affair is a product of its times. It, it exists from 1906 to 1909. This was the height of the Wilhelmanian era, Belle Epoque, and the British Edwardian period, eras of empire, incredibly complex empires, extremely rigid empires, strict, stringent, austere, certainly not a very relaxed or casual atmosphere. Women could not vote during this era. Despite all rationality, aristocracy still reigned supreme in Germany, and the scandal was felt as extremely, as deeply, outrageously as it was because of where it was taking place in the first decade of the 20th century. It almost toppled the government. It was felt until the end of the empire. All right, let's get into the who's who of this affair. We'll start with Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. He was the Emperor of Germany from 1888 up until 1918. He was a person regarded as having rather a vile temperament. He was not well liked by his contemporaries, despite his adamant desire for the attention of others. He was regarded as superficially militant, and he ultimately wanted respect and especially attention. Next, we've got Friedrich von Holstein, advisor to the Kaiser. He resigned right before the scandal broke in protest over the first Moroccan crisis and the German pacifism that was imbued throughout the crisis. He was thought to have provided the information that ultimately triggered the scandal. Next, we've got Philip, Prince of Eulenburg. He was another Eminence Gris, another advisor to the Kaiser, and he was the leader of a coterie of courtiers known as the Liebenberg Round Table. He was a pacifist, and there were rumors going around that Eulenburg had influenced the Kaiser to remove Holstein from the court. He was always embroiled in controversy and scandal, and he was rumored to be a homosexual. Next, we've got Maximilian Hardin. Not a very nice gentleman, not a very well-liked person. Hardin was a publisher, a vessel for ex-courtier criticism. Most notably, Otto von Bismarck, upon resigning, went immediately to Hardin and gave salacious secrets of the court just to get revenge. Hardin would break the scandal in 1906, going into 1907. Next, we've got General Kuno Graf von Mulke. He was the adjunct to Kaiser Wilhelm II, as well as a close associate of Philip, and would be implicated in the scandal alongside. Lastly, Chancellor Bernard von Bulow, Chancellor of Germany, and thought to have also had a hand in convincing the Kaiser to accept the resignation of Holstein. He was also thought to have provided information that ultimately triggered the scandal to make a mockery out of the court and inflate his own position as Chancellor of the Reich. With that, we will now move on into a bit of context preceding the breaking of the scandal in 1906. Context in any historic situation is critically important, and in this affair, no less. Preceding 1905 and into 1905, the French had attempted to heighten their influence over the Sultanate of Morocco. Germany saw this as a threat to the ill balance of power, and they wanted to intervene. At the height of this crisis, the Kaiser himself visited the country of Morocco and became acquainted with the Sultan. He made certain overtures to the Sultan, intimating German support 
for Morocco against that of France, which indirectly impugned the French foreign policy with regards to Morocco. The Kaiser called for an international conference to deal with this issue, which drew the ire of many militant German politicians who favored a more aggressive approach when it came to international politics, rather than this pacifist diplomatic accord, upon which the Kaiser all too frequently relies. The French agreed, and the Al Jazeera's conference commenced. Now, this conference was a major test of a recent alliance between the French and the English, the Entente Cordiale. And to the dismay of the Kaiser, the British did back the French claim. The a firm strength of the Entente Cordiale was to drastically change German war planning thereafter. For now, the Germans realize that in any conflict in which Germany is perceived as the aggressor in an international relations sphere, Britain was going to back the French interests, at least for the foreseeable future. Holstein wanted the Kaiser to be more aggressive in this. He was not a pacifist like Philippe, Prince of Eulenburg. And upon the Kaiser's weakness in this crisis, Holstein submitted his letter of resignation. Now, Holstein never ultimately expected the Kaiser to accept this letter of resignation. It was a mere protest. And he found out pretty quickly that Philippe, Prince of Eulenburg, had influenced the Kaiser to accept that resignation. Now we're gonna get into the spring of 1906. Holstein writes a letter to Philippe, and he tells Philippe that he had heard that Philippe had tried to encourage the Kaiser to accept his resignation. He also in the letter intimated a lot of different rumors, like relationships Philippe had had with certain members of the court that had artistic dispositions, more effeminate personalities, and it was pretty clear that he intended to sabotage the reputation of Philippe as a last hurrah on his way out of the court. Philippe then challenges Holstein to a duel until a collective of Philippe's friends encouraged him to call the duel off, mostly because they had also heard about these rumors and felt this would only fan the flames. At the same time, Maximilian Hardin began to criticize the Liebenberg Round Table because he also disagreed with their pacifist influence on the Kaiser. The circle encouraged what Hardin believed to be the worst in Kaiser Wilhelm, encouraged him to promote a strict, personalized authoritarian rule, encouraged him to be more diplomatic in the face of international conflict and less militant and aggressive, and he too had heard rumors of this more effeminate, artistic disposition of the courtiers within the circle. He called them musical, poetic, he called them spiritualist, and said that this influence was negative in concern to the Kaiser because the Kaiser was starting to become more soft, more weak, more pacifist, and that undermined the authority and the moral superiority of German culture and Germany within the international community. Now, Holstein and Hardin also didn't get along, and they spent the summer of 1906 in this back and forth tennis match, nothing really important, mostly just attacking each other's character. Well, finally, they came to an accord in the height of summer. Now, in the fall of 1906, articles started to be published in Maximilian's journal, and these articles got even more suggestive. He started to publish poem plays featuring two male courtiers engaging in an intimate relationship. And Philippe had heard about these meetings between Holstein and Hardin, and had remembered Holstein's correspondence to Philippe, and he started to become very nervous. He made an agreement with Hardin in winter of 1906. The deal was Philippe, Prince of Eulenburg, was expected to become both physically and mentally distant from the court. And he did go down to the south of Germany and then to the south of France. But about a month later, he was called back to Berlin by the Kaiser because the Kaiser wanted to give him the Order of the Black Eagle. Now, the Order of the Black Eagle is an honorific that is bestowed by the Kaiser. And Philippe returned despite this agreement he had made with Hardin and accepted the order. It seems as if everything was back to normal. Hardin, of course, was not to allow that to continue much longer. In April 1907, Hardin began to publish another series of articles. They specifically called out three different military aides to the Kaiser by name as being homosexual. And in addition to that, he called out General Kuno von Moltke. He was also called out directly by name. Now, April 1907, Hardin was using these outings as a means to warn Philip, to say, I'm gonna get to you next. Now, Philippe doesn't take this seriously at all. And in May 1907, 
hard name Philippe Prince of Eulenburg directly as a homosexual and also engaging in a homosexual relationship with Kuno von Moltke. Now the Kaiser didn't find out about this until later on in the month and he found out by the crown prince. He was devastated by all of this. He didn't believe that Philippe was a homosexual. He had a wife. It didn't really seem to occur to the Kaiser. And unfortunately, he had to go with the protocol on this. He asked Kuno von Moltke and Eulenburg for their resignation. He also asked Philippe to, to return the Order of the Black Eagle to the Kaiser. But then what he said is, sue Hardin for libel, and then we can return to normal, everything will be hunky-dory. Hardin is down in Munich with his lawyer, Maximilian Bernstein. He had been taking these summer months in archives, interviewing people around Starnberg, where Philippe had an estate, and trying to come up with a defense that would ruin these two men. Now, the greatest part of the defense would be Kuno von Moltke's ex-wife's testimony. Her testimony would be based on their prior divorce proceedings and information found within that would characterize Kuno von Moltke as being quite effeminate, quite weak, physically, all of which at that time in 1907 was perceived as being an indication of homosexuality and homophilic uh, tendency. It was perceived by the public as such. Now von Moltke's ex-wife would take to the stand uh, pretty much at the beginning to set the tone for the entirety of this trial. She made a series of statements that would prove Kuno von Moltke was effeminate and try to impugn his character and assassinate his character. And she remembers one interesting occasion where Philippe had dropped his handkerchief. Kuno had picked it up and pressed his lips to it. She also detailed her secret divorce proceedings. Now these divorce proceedings claimed that she was physically abusive to her husband, that she was physically dominating over her husband. This testimony not only shocked the jury, but would shock the entire nation. Kaiser Wilhelm II, after this testimony was relayed to him, would collapse out of shock. Next, Magnus Hirschfeld would take the stand, who was the founder of the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, which was one of the first homosexual liberation movements in modern history. He felt outing well-known personalities in German society would normalize the idea of homosexuality. He gave the expert witness testimony saying that Kuno von Moltke was a homosexual, based on nothing else than his expert opinion, essentially. Now lastly, Maximilian Harden would take to the stand the defendant himself, and he would be pointing and shouting declarative statement. It got to the point where the judge essentially had to say, is there no room for compromise? Now Harden, of course, made a career on sensational journalism, so he was going to pull out all the stops here, and it worked in his favor. He was acquitted on the 29th of October, 1907. Philippe would go immediately to the Kaiser, to Chancellor Bernard von Bulov, von Moltke would as well, and they got the verdict overturned on a minor technicality. And there would be a trial later on that year in the winter of 1907. Kuno von Moltke was much better prepared. He would go on the attack, and his counsel essentially would take down every single testimony that was presented by Harden. Von Moltke's ex-wife, her entire testimony was thrown out. Magnus Hirschfeld didn't even feature in the trial. He withdrew his testimony. And Harden this time didn't put out much of an effort. So he was using this trial not as a means to get himself exonerated for the second time, but to build a defense that he can use against Philippe. Charge Philippe with a criminal offense. This criminal offense that he would charge Philippe with would be perjury. The perjury would come out of his testimony in this trial. Philippe's testimony when he took to the stand was, I have never had a relationship with a member of the same sex that was anything more than platonic. That was exactly what Hardin was waiting for because now all Hardin had to do was to find two credible testimonies that would disprove Philippe's statement and that in turn would exonerate Hardin from libel and it would make Philippe guilty of both perjury and homosexuality. That was Hardin's plan. And going into 1908, he started to arm himself to take down his real enemy, which was Philippe Prince of Eulenburg. The spring of 1908, despite this wonderful triumph that was rendered unto Philippe and Kuno von Moltke, they were still pretty much social outcasts. Unfortunately, the damage of the first trial had not gone away, and they were not really accepted in society, despite being so successful in the second trial. Now, Harden and Bernstein during the spring of 1906 are gonna work together to try to find an official platform to present their findings of perjury. They essentially, in the background, use their connections 
to get a minor newspaper to print something that could be considered libelous against Hardin. Upon this article coming out, Hardin sued them, so that way he could get access to a courtroom. During this trial, Hardin would present three witnesses that he says can prove Philippe lied under oath. Because it got submitted to the record so quickly, the court couldn't help but to address it. The three witnesses that Hardin brings forth are Jacob Ernst, a gentleman by the name of Rydell, and a Max Musterman, a kind of unnamed third source that could corroborate the relationship between the secondary sources and Uhlenberg. So Hardin not only presented two witnesses that had had an intimate relationship with Philippe, but he also presented a third witness that could corroborate one of those relationships as having transpired. And it gave so much more credibility to Hardin's allegations. And these three witnesses were accepted by the court under official record, corroborating evidence. And Philippe was not yet in the good graces of the Kaiser or back to where he was. And he was ultimately not afforded as much protection as he may have once had. Therefore, a new perjury trial was ordered against Philippe. Chancellor Bernard von Bulov was instructed to arrest Philippe. And that brings us to the summer of 1908. We've got another trial coming. And that will see Philippe, Prince of Eulenburg, on the defensive, charged with perjury. Now, Philippe had actually gained some traction during the summer of 1908 in concern to gaining back his old friends. A lot of the summer of 1908 was spent exactly the same way as the last summer, which is to say not concerning himself at all with preparation of the trial. It's very interesting to me, at least, that it seems there was little to no preparation on behalf of Philippe. He was just excited to be back in the Kaiser's good graces again. Now, the Kaiser is silent with regards to the trial. He doesn't mention it, talk about it, not a part of conversation whatsoever. And during this period of silence from the Kaiser, Philippe doing whatever he wants pretty much, Hardin has built a coterie with a list of 145 witnesses to take to the stand to accuse Philippe of being a homosexual. There's still a lot to transpire before the trial happens with regards to all of the evidence mounting against him. By the time the trial starts in the fall, it would be incredibly difficult to disprove the testimony of the witnesses that were left, considering how much they had been whittled down. Now, these witnesses were made of thieves, prostitutes, blackmailers, just regular homosexuals, of course. But it was quite a collective of people that kept coming in and out of the courtroom. What's probably more important to the affair, ultimately, is not so much the salacious, underworld, Babylon witnesses. It's the witnesses that were military personnel, soldiers, sailors, officers. This created an unprecedented moral panic in the German Empire. The military was the foundation for German nationalism, German culture, and German legitimacy, court legitimacy. And this directly undermined and impugned that. And because so many people from the military were coming forward, military was becoming weak, effeminate, losing its authority, it was losing its stamina. And it created a crisis, a moral crisis, but also a political crisis because the Entente Cordiale was legitimized between France and Britain. The military in Germany was seen as weak and incapable. It created a huge outrage amongst the people, a panic. People's enthusiasm for war was promoted. It's enthusiasm for war as a moral cleanser of Germany. On the last day that Philippe and Hardin were to see each other in a courtroom setting, Bernstein brought up a very interesting letter that was sent from Philippe to Hardin in December of 1907, right after the second trial. And this letter essentially was a plea by Philippe to not take the trial any further because Philippe knew he had perjured himself. When it was presented in July, it was quite unexpected. Philippe would faint in court, collapse, carried out on a stretcher, and the trial thereafter would take place in a hospital. By the beginning of fall 1908, there were 12 witnesses left. And by the height of fall the same year, there was only one, and that was Jacob Ernst. Now, Jacob Ernst was one of the original of the three witnesses that were called in Munich, a fisherman's son near Lake Starnberg, where Philippe had had an estate. Hardin had suggested that Philippe had had an intimate relationship with this fisherman's son 
uh, about 20 years earlier. When the fisherman's son was called to testify, he basically went back on everything he had told Hardin and said, I had had no relationship of any sort with this person, never knew him in that way, we were strictly friends, it was all platonic, confirming everything Philippe had been saying. But then, of course, Bernstein reminded Jacob Ernst of that unknown tertiary witness who could confirm there was a relationship between Jacob Ernst and Philippe, Prince of Eulenburg. Ernst very quickly changed his tune afterwards. After this testimony was made clear, Philippe lost it. The statements he made thereafter were irrational, outrageous. Not only did they serve to diminish his own credibility, but it had drastic political consequences outside of the courtroom. He accused Otto von Bismarck of starting these homosexual rumors. He accused his Bavarian opponents of spreading these rumors around. It reignited regional conflict between the North and the South. Philippe unfortunately just lost his temper during this trial, all from a hospital room. And by November 1908, we get to the height of the Eulenburg affair, when the public was most outraged, when the newspapers were saying the most spurious things. And in November of 1908, Far away from Berlin at a hunting lodge, Dietrich von Holsen, he was at a hunting lodge with Kaiser Wilhelm II. Dietrich thought it would be very humorous to go upstairs, put on a ballet tutu, prance about, put on a show. He thought that was going to be hilarious. He put on the tutu, he came downstairs and he started prancing about and dropped dead of a heart attack in front of the Kaiser, all the courtiers around him. And this was nothing they could really cover up. The police got there. He is in a tutu. Once the press got that, it became ridiculous. People were accusing the Kaiser of homosexuality. It was getting out of control, and France, Britain, Britain especially, was terrified of this scandal crossing borders. That was the apex of it. It was a very cold winter. Philippe essentially was convalescing. There wasn't a lot of testimony and doctors were really saying he can't handle much more. So the trial was kind of put off until the summer of 1909. Now in the summer of 1909, Prince Eulenburg was given the okay by physicians to return to court. And so he was carried on a stretcher into the courtroom and the trial was to recommence. Just as the trial recommenced, Hardin took to his feet, puffed out his chest and essentially said, I think Philippe has been lying this entire time about the illness, and that should get added to his charges as well. He presented evidence to the court, different witnesses saying that Philippe had been flagrantly enjoying hunting parties, certainly not needing to be confined to a hospital, certainly able to take to a trial. And Philippe collapses, faints for the second time in this trial. And the trial would never recommence after that. Philippe would never be exonerated from the charge, but the trial would fade into a bureaucratic oblivion at that point. There are obviously many direct and indirect effects of this affair, both on domestic and international fronts. We saw the resignation of many courtiers and the reshuffling of the Kaiser's inner circle. This affair would drastically alter who the Kaiser was listening to and who had the greatest influence over him. And the public perception of court Byzantinism only served to augment the public's the criticism of the Kaiser. He was already not a well-liked person, and this affair solidified in many people's minds. He was not only not improving the reputation of the German Empire, but he was actively diminishing it because of the contemporaneous connection between homosexuality and pacifism. It was an indirect way to criticize the Kaiser and just opened up a new front against him. There was a notable military spending increase after this affair happened. And this was because these affairs at the time all had to do with public perception of the Kaiser and his courtiers being very pacifist. And an increase in military spending was seen by the Kaiser as the best way to diminish this sort of criticism of pacifism. In addition to that, enthusiasm for the war was heightened. War started to be seen as a moral cleanser for German culture and German nationalism. Franco-German press wars in the summer of 1907 would also heighten tension between the two countries. It became very clear after this scandal that masculinity was an incredibly precarious pillar of sand upon which the German Empire rested. Notably, military parades and military exercises diminished after this in Germany. Because homosexuality was at the center of an affair that caused so much anxiety, unfortunately, people saw themselves more fit to criticize homosexuality. So with that, that's all I have. I hope you check out some of the links below. If you have any recommendations on things to do next, I would love to hear about it. Again, I'm Chris, signing off. Oh.
ません。